he says that, that his notes, um, a careful and extended report on the proceedings and discussions of that body, which were with closed doors by a member, him, who is constant in his attendance, will be particularly gratifying to the people of the United States and to all who take an interest in the progress of political science and the cause of true liberty. Okay. So today we talk about the progress of political science and the cause of true liberty. And we're fortunate to have as our keynote speaker, Professor Richard Beeman. Rick Beeman is professor of history at the University of uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, his field is particularly this era, the era of the American Revolution and, and the founding. He has many credentials, formerly dean of the School of Arts and Sciences at Penn. I can read a few of his others. Uh, uh, he took his turn as a Harmsworth Professor of American History at Oxford, resident scholar at the Huntington Library. This is the best one. Resident scholar at the Rockefeller Study Center in Bellagio. <laughs> Visiting member. <laughs> Visiting member, Institute of Advanced Studies at Princeton, National Endowment of Humanities Senior Fellowship, and the list goes on. He's the author of seven books. Uh, for today's purposes, most notably, his book, Plain, Honest Men, The Making of the Constitution, the winner of two prestigious awards, the George Washington Book Prize and the Literary Award of the Philadelphia Athenaeum. Uh, earlier, there were copies of the book on sale outside. They may be back this afternoon. Okay. The, the reviews of uh, his uh, book, have been very positive. And let me read from, read, read from a few of these complimentary views. Okay, excerpt from Publishers Weekly. This account is now the most authoritative, up-to-date treatment of the Constitutional Convention since Catherine Drinker Bowen's miracle at Philadelphia over 40 years ago. It is unlikely to be surpassed. Uh, the George Washington Book Prize jurors uh, described his book as, quote, the fullest and most authentic account of the Constitutional Convention ever written. Okay. Noted author Walter Ixon says, Beeman's work is distinguished by a gently judicious tone that allows us to appreciate and draw some lessons from the delicate balances that emerged out of that passion-filled Philadelphia crucible. Okay. In addition, this book and his most recent book, The Penguin Guide to the American Constitution, um, as well as I should mention his TV appearances. If you look on the internet, you can find his interview on The John Stewart Show. Okay. Uh, and these have enabled him to expand his professional world from beyond not just the academic world, but into the world of the public intellectual. And I've long thought we need a lot more public intellectuals around here. Okay. So without further ado, uh, Professor Rick Beeman. I, I just looked down and I realized that I'm wearing exactly the same outfit that I wore on the on the on the Daily Show. I, <laughs> uh, uh, so this uh, this presentation that I'm going to give, particularly as I, I look back on this morning's activities where we really had some uh, uh, pretty intellectually weighty stuff, uh, uh, this can be regarded either as a more lighthearted uh, approach to these days proceedings or uh, a, 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 a kind of intellectual debasement of <laughs> the spirit of, <laughs> of, uh, of, of the day. Uh, I, I wanted to just say one word about, uh, I've got a few uh, illustrations uh, on the screen, and I just want to say uh, a, a word of, uh, about this one. This is, in fact, uh, on the cover uh, of the book. Uh, there is no authentic uh, contemporary rendering either of the signing of the Declaration of Independence. Jonathan Trumbull's is entirely imagined many decades after the fact, nor is there a rendering uh, of the signing of the Constitution. I, I chose this one, which was actually commissioned by a, a, an artist who just passed away this year uh, for the bicentennial in 1987, a man named Norman Glansman. Uh, but I, I used it because it's the only rendering uh, 
uh, which depicts uh, the assembly room of Independence Hall as probably as close to as it looked in 1787. Uh, as, as we know, it, it reflects the, re the careful restoration done uh, by the Park Service uh, in the uh, uh, late uh, 1960s. If you look at the, the Trumbull uh, portraits and others, they're very, very fanciful in terms of making the room look a lot more uh, lavish. Uh, the other reason I like it is that uh, is that Glansman was very careful and he collected uh, portraits of every one uh, of the folks in the room that day. So although we cannot be absolutely certain about the body type, uh, the faces uh, are actually quite uh, quite accurate. Uh, but I can't, and, and so he had uh, the faces of all uh, uh, of the signers of the Constitution, except one. Here's Jacob Broom of Delaware. <laughs> there is no portrait. <laughs> so he's bending over in all these seats. <laughs> backside. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I start on that weighty, <laughs> uh, incisively analytic uh, uh, note. Um, uh, this book, Plain Honest Men, is, is a book that I've been thinking about and thinking about writing uh, for all of the 43 years of my career as a professor uh, at, at Penn. Uh, and really thinking about it even before that, because I read Catherine Drinker Bowen's uh, Miracle at Philadelphia as a graduate student and really fell in love with the subject of the Constitution and the Constitutional uh, Convention. I, I waited 40 plus years to write this book uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, uh, I, I, I'm glad that I had reached the point in my career where I really could try to write a a book for that quote elusive general public, uh, or the the uh, intelligent general public, even more elusive, um, and, and so it seemed the the, the right uh, time. It turns out that my timing was 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 very good, uh, not only in terms of book sales, but but also in terms of 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 my emotional state. Uh, the Constitution has always occupied a special place in the minds uh, of Americans. It's, it's actually quite remarkable, even after a bitter fight over its ratification in which there were bitter opponents to the Constitution, within just a few years, both sides of every political conflict have been citing the Constitution as the definitive text uh, that defines all that is good and great uh, about American politics. It has become, as a good many commentators have, have noted, uh, America's civil religion. Uh, lacking a common ethnicity or a, a, a common national religion, uh, we really have uh, come to define our values and our ideals uh, uh, around maybe our two sacred texts, the Declaration of Independence uh, and, and, and the Constitution. Um, yet at this moment uh, in our history, uh, we find such widely, <laughs> viciously uh, varying views about how that Constitution should be interpreted. Never in my lifetime uh, have I seen a, a nation so polarized uh, about, our, about what our Constitution means and about how it, it should uh, be interpreted. Um, that's the, 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 the bad news. Uh, a little piece of, of good news, though, is that across the whole of that political spectrum, uh, there is an extraordinary reverence for the document. It still really uh, it is the, the, the central text in, in, in our uh, public life. Uh, there's another consensus, alas, I think that is shared uh, across this uh, uh, very wide political spectrum in the country today, and that is one of utter dismay. Utter dismay about the way our political system uh, is functioning under that uh, Constitution. And I think particular dismay, a dismay uh, which I'll confess uh, I, I share uh, with our current politics as practiced in our nation's Congress. Uh, I probably don't have to tell anyone in this audience that our Congress as an institution uh, is not held in very high esteem by most uh, Americans. Interestingly, our individual congressmen often are held in high esteem by their constituents, but Congress as an institution hasn't been doing so well uh, for so many years now. It has seemed nearly paralyzed by partisan gridlock, uh, 
uh, managing either to do very little in the way of legislating or uh, when it has carried out its legislative function, passing that legislation only after engaging in deeply depressing partisan uh, rancor. In its present incarnation, uh, I fear, it, it does not fulfill the hopes uh, that our founders had for it when they placed it in Article I of the Constitution, devoting far more space to spelling out the powers and responsibilities of that body than uh, the other two branches uh, of government. So with all that in mind, I've begun asking myself how it was that the 55 men gathered in Philadelphia uh, that summer in 1787, extraordinarily diverse in their cultural backgrounds, representing often widely varying economic and geographic interests, um, merchants, lawyers, large-scale farmers and plantation owners, uh, slave owners and non-slave owners, uh, a, a host of uh, regional uh, interests represented uh, there, uh, uh, many, perhaps most of them clinging tenaciously to their primary identities as representatives of independent uh, and sovereign estates. Uh, how it was that these folks were able to get so much done, uh, to create a document that was, to use George Washington's phrase, so little liable uh, to well-founded uh, uh, objections. And actually, I do want to just say one more uh, set of words about this, this group of men here. I know that to 21st century eyes, they all look kind of the same, right? They're all a bunch of dead, wealthy white men. Uh, but, but in fact, uh, in the context of the provincial world of the 18th century, uh, these folks brought to that convention uh, all of the provincial attachments and all of the differences uh, divided uh, at America uh, at that time. So we should not minimize the, uh, the, the extent to which they had to, to overcome uh, that particular challenges uh, as they gathered. So how did they, how did they do uh, so much? I'm sorry, just yet one other uh, di digression. Um, uh, Senator Grassley of uh, Iowa, in, in the uh, uh, course of the debate over health care, uh, uh, said, he said, you know, we, we shouldn't do a big sweeping overhaul. Uh, Americans and the Congress doesn't do sweeping reform very well at all. We're into incremental change. <laughs> the founding fathers had gathered in uh, Philadelphia in 1787. We'd still be debating minor amendments to the Articles <laughs> of Confederation. <laughs> so, so how did they manage to get uh, so much uh, done? Uh, well, the first the lies in the fact uh, just uh, mentioned that the delegates met in secret and were able to a remarkable extent to enforce that secrecy uh, all that summer, literally barely a word of their proceedings that summer uh, gets out in, in, into the public print. In fact, when the Philadelphia newspapers uh, published anything about the proceedings of the convention, it was almost always false. Uh, they just didn't have a clue about what was uh, going on. Now, this is a distinctly undemocratic, untransparent way of doing business, indeed unthinkable and probably undesirable in today's world. Uh, but it allowed the delegates to disagree, sometimes vehemently, over a wide range of issues, and then uh, when the day was over to repair uh, to Philadelphia's city tavern, still uh, in operation uh, down there on uh, 2nd Walnut Street, or, or the Indian Queen, uh, the Philadelphia's largest tavern, but no longer uh, uh, there, uh, to repair to one of the city's taverns to share uh, a meal, usually accompanied by copious quantities uh, uh, of alcohol. Uh, these uh, 18th century folks uh, in every social class basically started drinking alcohol at breakfast where they had uh, what they actually called light beer. But it wasn't so much low in calories, but it was slightly lower in alcoholic uh, content. And uh, then they, they continued to drink until they turned in uh, at night. So it allowed them to repair to the city's taverns to uh, get together over a meal and, and, and something to drink, and then uh, after a good night's sleep, and they, they actually did have a good night's sleep because they usually didn't start the next morning till 10.30 or 11 uh, in the morning, uh, uh, to put the disagreements of the previous day behind them and try once again to reach consensus on the issues uh, b b before them. Um, uh, I think we can all imagine the difference if we were to hold a constitutional convention 
today. The public posturing, the staking out of inflexible positions on the convention floor. Uh, the delegates greeted by television cameras from CNN and MSNBC and uh, Fox News uh, as they uh, departed uh, from the convention hall uh, prepared with carefully prepared sound bites to give uh, to the television uh, audience. Uh, the media bloviators dissecting every word of every speech. Uh, really a scene too horrible for me anyway to contemplate. Uh, I, I, I must say I nightly pray that our lawmakers and the American public will never avail themselves of their constitutional entitlement to call another constitutional convention, which would surely, uh, surely take place in the harsh glare of the uh, public eye. Uh, the role of secrecy, however alien to our present day values, did allow the delegates <coughs> to put the business of the convention ahead of their own celebrity, uh, ahead of their own particular political uh, agendas. The second explanation uh, is actually uh, very closely uh, related to the first, and that was the extraordinary intimacy of the spaces in which the delegates uh, did their, their work. And this uh, is only a partial view of uh, the assembly room of the Pennsylvania State House. But at uh, 40 feet by 40 feet, uh, the assembly room of uh, Independence Hall is actually very, very small. And in fact, if you take into consideration that bar that keeps the public out of the actual uh, 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 deliberation space, it's, it's even uh, smaller. Uh, these kind of clunky Windsor chairs uh, uh, arranged uh, around uh, uh, the, the tables take up a lot of space. It was very difficult for the delegates even to whisper to a neighbor, neighbor uh, without it uh, being uh, overheard. For example, uh, the, the desks of the delegations from Pennsylvania and Delaware are right next to each other. Governor Morris uh, of Pennsylvania and Gunning Bedford of Delaware were hardly the best of, of buddies, to say the least. I'll allude to this in, uh, in, in just a minute. But it really wasn't possible for uh, if, if Gunning Bedford was going to adhere to 18th century rules of civility to lean over to his neighbor and uh, you know, tell him what a jerk he thought that Governor Morris uh, was. <laughs> And again, after the day's official work was done, uh, dining together around a common table, uh, lodging together uh, at one of the city's uh, boarding houses, uh, sometimes, as in the case of the Connecticut delegation, even sharing the same room, uh, all of that intimacy forced a civility and an impulse toward consensus uh, not easily uh, replicated uh, today. Um, it is so very different in the Washington, D.C. Uh, uh, of today, where basically, the first of all, the, the members of Congress are there sort of from Monday through Thursday or Tuesday through Thursday, and then they got to go home and campaign for the next uh, 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 election. Uh, but it is a very hard to imagine a Harry Reid and Mitch McConnell or Charles Schumer and John Kyle going out uh, to uh, one of the city's uh, eateries and enjoying a pleasant and convivial uh, meal together. Uh, sadly, I mean, this, this uh, was not always the case, not only in the 18th century, but as early as the 1960s and 1970s, uh, members of Congress who, who stayed in Washington longer during the week, uh, I think really did across the aisle uh, uh, socialize in ways that, that, that helped the machinery of government uh, rather than uh, hindered it. Uh, so I think the intimacy of the spaces and, and, and the whole social set of social rituals uh, uh, ease uh, conviviality and uh, consensus. Uh, I would note just one other thing as well, and that is that because these folks were overwhelmingly wealthy white men who lived uh, either in fancy plantation houses or if they were uh, merchants and lawyers in fancy uh, townhouses, um, they weren't altogether happy about being stuck in Philadelphia in the summer, uh, sharing <laughs> tiny little rooms in a few of the city's boarding houses. They wanted to get the hell home, uh, and, and so they really did want to get on uh, with their business, even though that business took them longer, I think, than many of them uh, had anticipated. So those are, are two reasons. I, I, I now want to go on and spend a, a good deal more time on the third explanation. Uh, which seems to me the most important, if also the most elusive, uh, 
And I speak of leadership and of the varieties of leadership present in that uh, convention. And if those qualities cannot be exactly replicated in our present situation, I do hope that they could be emulated. Over the course of the past several years, as I've lived uh, with these delegates who inhabited the assembly room of Independence Hall, I have become more and more impressed by the importance of individual uh, leadership in the making of the Constitution. But even more strikingly, by the importance of collective leadership. However talented many of the 55 delegates may have been, all that talent uh, might well have worked in counterproductive ways uh, had they not possessed an understanding that cooperation, uh, forbearance, and ultimately a compromise uh, were every bit as important as individual brilliance in the business of Constitution making. Uh, the men who drafted the Constitution were, by almost any standard I can think of, an incredibly impressive uh, bunch. Um, uh, I would happily trade them for <laughs> even the best of the, the 55 uh, member of 535 members of our current Congress. Uh, there were, to be sure, some among them whose contributions to the finished document were negligible. There were perhaps as many as a dozen who were notable primarily for their extended absences uh, from the convention, among them actually Alexander Hamilton. Uh, uh, and uh, there were at least a few. Uh, here's one, Gunning Bedford of Delaware, a corpulent, florid-faced man given to outbursts accusing the large state delegates of attempting to destroy his tiny state. At one point in the debates over representation uh, in, in the Congress, he threatened uh, to lead Delaware and other small states in an alliance uh, with a foreign power to combat the... Uh, the uh, uh, the overriding power of the large states. This is what provoked his confrontation with Governor Morris, who basically said, you try it and you'll be sorry. Uh, uh, and then here's Luther Martin of Maryland, described by uh, uh, one distinguished historian as being as having been sober on only a half dozen occasions in his life, <laughs> none of them during the Constitutional uh, Convention. Uh, uh, Luther Martin on June 27th and June 28th uh, gave this day and a half long speech denouncing almost every feature of the, uh, of, the of the Virginia plan, uh, a speech fueled uh, significantly by alcohol. Uh, he was sweating profusely during this uh, speech, and they said he kept drinking alcohol to sort of replace all the liquid that he was, uh, was, was losing. James Madison, who, who was, as, as, as has been noted, you know, was extremely diligent in taking notes in the convention, finally just gave up on, on, on this one. And he said, and the rest continued for some time with much diffuseness, et cetera, uh, et cetera. Uh, and there was uh, at least one a certifiable curmudgeon in, in the convention. Uh, uh, this is my nominee for my least favorite convention delegate. This is Elbridge Gerry of Massachusetts, who pretty much hated every minute of his summer in Philadelphia and, and did everything he could to torpedo uh, the effort. He complained about the heat, the stench of the city, the manners and morals of the city's uh, citizens, uh, and he really did complain about ne nearly every feature of the document they were uh, uh, drafting. Now, I, I think that the, the, the real source of his unhappiness uh, is that he, he had, uh, uh, Gary was about, 40, I think, 42 years old. He had recently ma married a, a beautiful and much younger woman, Anne, and his wife, uh, who I think was 22 or 23. Uh, she was from New York City. And she found Philadelphia incredibly provincial and boring compared to the high life of, of, of New York City. Uh, by the way, although uh, Gary was twice Anne's age, uh, people who saw them together said that he looked to be three or four times. Her age. She was very young and beautiful, and he was uh, less so. Uh, but so after a couple of days in Philadelphia, she decamped back to New York City. Uh, leaving Gary alone in a boarding house in uh, this city. So he was not a happy a camper. But on the whole, it's hard not to be impressed by the way in which most of the men present that summer were able to check their egos and their self-interested impulses at the door and to take seriously the business of creating uh, a more perfect uh, union. Uh, the qualities of leadership present in the convention were 
enormously uh, varied and, and uh, uh, this morning or now afternoon, I want to offer just a few examples of the range of personalities and intellects uh, who spent that summer together uh, in Philadelphia. And I begin uh, with the man who we've just been talking about, uh, the man who provided the guiding intellectual force behind first the movement to call a constitutional convention, and then the effort to craft a proposal that amounted to what I have called a genuine revolution in the nature of American uh, government. Uh, James Madison was, by all accounts, one of the most physically unimposing men present at, at the convention. Uh, a 37-year-old bachelor with a notable record of romantic failure up to that the time, uh, standing only a few inches over five feet tall and uh, prematurely bald. And you can see in this portrait, uh, Madison frequently brushed the few remaining wisps of hair at the top of his head downward to hide his bald spot in what today we would call a comb over. Uh, <laughs> chronically suffering from a combination of poor physical health and hypochondria and painfully awkward in any form of public speech. Almost everyone commented on the fact that he tended not so much to speak as to mumble, and people were always straining to try to hear what he had to say. Uh, Madison comes across, at least in the year 1787, as neither a commanding nor uh, a self-confident figure. I have to say, by the time he gets lucky, uh, and Mary's Dolly Madison, I think a, a kind of personal transformation uh, uh, occurs with Madison. He becomes a more uh, self-confident self and, and, and outgoing uh, person, to which I think we can give large credit to, to Dolly. Uh, but Madison's whole manner in 1787 betrayed an insecurity of the sort that we do not normally associate uh, with uh, political uh, leadership. Uh, but he more than made up for those deficiencies by the force and persistence of his intellect. He arrived in Philadelphia on May 3rd, 1787, uh, unannounced, unheralded. He just kind of snuck into town. Uh, he came from New York, actually, where he'd been serving in the Continental Congress. He arrived 11 days before the convention was uh, due to begin and actually 22 days before it actually began. He arrived with a clear idea of what needed to be accomplished in the coming weeks. He had spent a part of the early spring of 1787 preparing treatises on the weaknesses of the existing government and on possible remedies for those weaknesses. He'd been a key player in the gathering of men in Annapolis, Maryland that had issued a call for a constitutional convention. And he had been very active in lobbying influential citizens uh, the most notable of whom was uh, George Washington, uh, to put their weight behind <laughs> such a convention. When it came time for the convention to begin, which was supposed to be May 14th, 1787, Madison was deeply disappointed that the only delegates from out of state to arrive uh, were he uh, and George Washington. Uh, this is, when you think about it, uh, a t really an amazing fact. This is the constitutional convention. Uh, and while it is true uh, that there had been a, a lot of rain in the preceding weeks up and down the East Coast, so the usually poor roads were in even poorer condition, uh, it does not seem to me that bad weather uh, can explain the fact that it took 11 more days uh, for even a bare majority, seven of 13 state delegations, uh, to assemble a bare quorum of their representatives uh, in uh, uh, Philadelphia. The real enemy that, that, that Madison knew he was confronting, uh, or the twin enemies, uh, were provincialism and apathy. Uh, and in that regard, it's worth noting the roster of men who uh, either were not able to attend or who chose not to attend. Uh, Patrick Henry of, of Virginia, who uh, I noted earlier would have been sort of the, the leader of the Tea Party revolt against Madison's effort uh, for a stronger central uh, government. Sam Adams uh, and John Hancock of Massachusetts, two of the spearheads uh, of the revolution. Governor George Clinton of New York, the most powerful politician in New York, chose not to attend. And of course, John Adams and uh, uh, Thomas Jefferson were, were serving abroad as ambassadors, so they were not uh, there either. So uh, there really is, there, there are notable absences uh, from this uh, convention. Uh, you know, it, it wouldn't, wouldn't you think 
that if you were elected a delegate to the convention, that you'd want to show up on time. That this, <laughs> that this is a really, this is a big deal. But in fact, it has only become a big deal in <laughs> retrospect. Uh, the, the success of this gathering was not only not inevitable, it was perhaps uh, even uh, Im improbable. Um, so, I mean, that's the, the setting as, as, as the opening day of the convention uh, dawns with uh, Madison and Washington uh, walking together uh, to the convention uh, 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 to the convention site and finding that aside from the Pennsylvania delegates, they're the only ones there. Uh, but Madison put the 11-day hiatus between the scheduled start date of the convention and its actual beginning to very good use. Working closely with the delegates from Pennsylvania, Madison was the principal architect of what came to be called the Virginia Plan, a proposal presented by Madison's Virginia colleague, Governor Edmund Randolph, during the opening days of the convention. A plan that called for the scrapping of the old Articles of Confederation and the creation of a national government with a supreme legislature, executive, uh, and, and judiciary. In its initial form, uh, the Virginia plan really was a highly nationalistic plan which made it very clear that the national government was going to uh, be supreme to those uh, uh, of the states. Uh, although the document that emerged from the convention on September 17th was in fact quite different from the plan that Madison, Randolph, and the Pennsylvanians had crafted during that week in May. Uh, Madison's careful planning and his meticulously well-prepared defense of a strong central government uh, set the convention on a revolutionary uh, course. Uh, I will just want to mention one other fact in the crafting of the Virginia plan. Uh, 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 there's another key figure in this who we'll get to in, in a moment, and, and that was uh, Benjamin Franklin, who acted in this case, as in so many others during the convention, as a key facilitator. On May 16th, he hosted uh, a, a dinner uh, in his newly uh, uh, expanded and renovated home uh, in Philadelphia, a dinner consisting of those delegates already who had made it already to the Senate, which consisted mainly of the Virginians and the Pennsylvanians. And, and although these folks in subsequent years uh, would interact with one another quite often, at this point they barely knew one another. Even Washington and Franklin, who had certainly met on previous occasions, their lives for the previous uh, 10 years or so uh, had been separated with, uh, with uh, Franklin in, in France and uh, Washington commanding uh, the Continental Army. So over a sumptuous meal uh, and a, a cask of porter in which he took inordinate pride, he was very pleased that they consumed the entire contents of this <laughs> cast during uh, that evening. Uh, Franklin, I think, helped to uh, sort of oil the uh, convivial impulses of these uh, delegates. Madison's two, uh, I actually want to mention just one other uh, one of Madison's uh, contributions. Uh, just to, to, to point to this, and, and, and you've already mentioned it, this little uh, table here, here's where Washington's sitting, this, this little desk here was really supposed to only have one chair, which was a chair to be occupied by the secretary of the convention, William Jackson, who was uh, not a delegate, but who was entrusted with the job of keeping the convention journal, a job where he did just terribly, he made a complete hash of it. But Madison, <laughs> unbidden on the first day of the convention, goes up, takes a chair next to Jackson in the front of the room so he can hear what's going on and nerd that he is. Um, he just diligently uh, takes notes on every speech given uh, in the convention. If he didn't catch it all, he would approach the delegates afterward and see if they had uh, you know, written uh, texts of their, of their speeches. Well, most of the other delegates were going out to the city tavern of the Indian Queen to dine and drink. Madison was in his room at Mary House's boarding house revising his notes. Uh, so we really do have him to thank for uh, the extraordinary record of the convention uh, as, as well. Madison's two uh, strongest supporters in the effort to craft a new government were two Pennsylvanians, James Wilson and Governor Morris. Wilson, like Madison, seemed to many observers awkward, somewhat uncomfortable in his own uh, skin. Uh, although perhaps he did not intend it, 
Wilson took such pride in his intellect that he was sometimes unable to hide his feelings of superiority over those ordinary citizens around him. This uh, portrait here, which is the only one we have of him, in, in which he appears with a prim white wig and thick lensed glasses, conveys the, the impression, at least to me, of a man who is looking down his nose uh, at those around him. Yet Wilson, more than any man in the convention, envisioned an American government and an American president, much like those we have today, vigorous and powerful, but based firmly and directly on the will of the people, uh, reacting to the inability of the Confederation government to speak with a single voice, Wilson argued that only a president elected directly by the people of the nation at large could give the necessary energy and direction to the new national government. Uh, he was, uh, alas, a minority of one in the convention, and his proposal for direct popular election uh, of the president was never even uh, uh, put uh, to a vote. Um, be happy to talk about the reasons uh, for that at, at, at some other uh, time. Uh, but throughout the convention, Wilson reminded the delegates that only a government based solidly on the will of we the people, and that phrase, we the people, is James Wilson's a phrase, he uses it uh, repeatedly uh, during the convention. Only a government based on the will of we the people could fulfill the needs of this still fragile country. We can also thank Wilson for the peculiar compromise proposal by which we now elect our president, the Electoral uh, College. Uh, you know, if, if you've had your students uh, or if you've tried yourself, <laughs> to read that section of, of, of the Constitution relating to the election of the president. It's so long and convoluted. The Constitution is a very short document, only about only four parchment pages. I think it would be three parchment pages if they could have eliminated, if they could have just had direct popular election uh, of the president. Uh, Wilson also was the first to come up with a version of the Electoral College, although he continued to favor direct popular election of the president. Uh, he, he proposed the Electoral College uh, as the next uh, best alternative to a popular election, which uh, I think it has proven to be. Another delegate from Pennsylvania, Governor Morris, uh, he's uh, the, the guy slouching there uh, uh, in, in his chair at, at the desk, uh, played a role at least as significant as that of Wilson, but his personality and character were altogether different from those of either Wilson or Madison. Uh, Morris was an imposing physical specimen, although I can't really see it here because he's slouching. Uh, he stands over six feet tall, uh, well proportioned with a prominent nose and a, a strong a chin. Uh, whereas James Madison had immersed himself in the study of political philosophy at Princeton and James Wilson had distinguished himself as an outstanding student of theology and philosophy at St. Andrews in his native uh, Scotland, uh, Governor Morris was writing his bachelor's and master's essays on wit and beauty uh, at King's College, later Columbia, uh, in New York. And whereas Madison's love life, both as a college student and for many years thereafter, uh, resembled that of a medieval monk, uh, uh, Morris's interests in topics such as wit, beauty, and love was not uh, purely cerebral. And as a young man, and indeed well into his adulthood, uh, and he delayed uh, marriage actually until he was in his 40s, Morris never passed up an uh, opportunity for amorous uh, adventure. He began his career in New York, uh, but after losing favor with many of the leading politicians of that state, uh, he moved to, to Pennsylvania. He got, lost favor, actually, because he was, a strong, he was strongly involved in the affairs of the Continental Congress and really interested in increasing the powers of the Articles of Confederation. Uh, and his constituents in New York, nor many of his colleagues in the New York legislature, did not think that was a good idea. In any case, shortly after his arrival in Pennsylvania, he suffered a serious setback of another kind. In 1780, Morris's left leg was caught in the wheel of a carriage, dislocating his ankle joint and badly breaking his leg. His regular physician was temporarily absent from the city, and acting on the advice of others, Morris agreed to have his leg amputated. Uh, when uh, Morris's regular physician returned to town, he was appalled at, at the decision. It's completely unnecessary. I mean, this was a medical malpractice case <laughs> in, in the making. Uh, but the, the deed was done. 
And for the rest of his life, Morris would walk with a simple oak peg, which until just a few weeks ago actually was on display at the National Constitution Center. I'd never seen it before. Uh, a, a simple oak peg attached to the stump of his leg just below the knee, uh, an infirmity by all accounts that did absolutely nothing to limit his highly active a love life. His political mentor in, in John Jay, uh, uh, writing in the uh, mid to late 1780s uh, uh, about Morris's uh, sexual indiscretions, uh, uh, wrote to a friend, and you know, he said, you know, sometimes I wish that Gouverneur had lost some other body part. <laughs> <laughs> Morris's rise to prominence in Pennsylvania was greatly aided by the mentorship of another influential Philadelphian, that rather self-satisfied portly gentleman standing next to him in this a portrait, the wealthy merchant uh, Robert Morris. Robert Morris uh, was uh, probably the most powerful man in, in America, with the exception of George Washington. During the uh, period of the Revolutionary War and the Confederation period, as director of finance of the Confederation government, uh, he wielded uh, uh, enormous, and, and to many Americans, somewhat scary uh, powers over America's financial dealings. Uh, both Morrises had an ill-conceived, concealed attempt for the common man and for the democratic tendencies in the revolutionary state governments. Although both Morrises may have taken their skepticism about democracy to extremes, it is important to remember that many, if not most of our founding fathers, were small r Republicans, not small d uh, Democrats. Uh, in a large measure, they had gathered there to create a government that would curb the democratic excesses uh, of the state uh, legislatures. And, and indeed, much of, uh, of the text of James Madison's uh, uh, a treatise on the vices of the political systems of the United States, uh, written in preparation to, uh, to the Constitutional Convention, really focused on the problems of the state governments and on the way in which democracy had to some extent run amok uh, in, in the states. Governor Morris would speak uh, more often, 173 times than any man in, in the convention, more than any man other than Madison, uh, always arguing for a vastly strengthened central government, always defending the interests of large uh, populous states like his own Pennsylvania. And whereas Madison and Wilson strove for moderation in their defense of a strong uh, national government, Morris did not shy away from combat. At times, he seemed prepared to abolish the state governments altogether. He spoke openly about doing that on the convention floor. Uh, and on several occasions, he confronted opponents of the principle of proportional representation from the smaller states, uh, confronted them directly, letting them know that if they refused to, to join a union, including such powerful states as Virginia, Pennsylvania, and Massachusetts, uh, they would pay a very heavy uh, price uh, in, indeed. So Governor Morris was certainly not a, a conciliator. Uh, but when it came time to pull together all of the many proposals and amendments into a single elegant draft of a completed constitution, it was Governor Morris who provided what James Madison acknowledged was the finish given to the style and arrangement of the constitution. Uh, as chairman of the committee uh, of style, a, a committee uh, created in the closing weeks of the convention, charged with the task of pulling together a, a final draft of a constitution, Morris took the 23 articles of the earlier Committee of Detail report, which amounts to a kind of rough draft of the Constitution, and by combining and editing, reduced that number to seven more artfully worded articles. And he replaced the clunky wording of the preamble of the Committee of Detail report, uh, which began, we the people of the states of New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, with a decidedly more elegant uh, beginning. We, the people of the capital U, capital S, United States, in order to form a more perfect union to establish justice, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do establish and ordain this Constitution. Morris's revision was not merely more elegant. Um, it's been suggested by a colleague of mine, by the way, but uh, uh, that uh, aside from the preamble, which is really quite elegant, uh, the rest of the Constitution, I mean, really is a, a legal text. 
I guess Justice Scalia would agree with that as well. Um, and, and, and a colleague of mine has contrasted the Declaration of Independence, uh, which is poetry, uh, with the U.S. Constitution, which he says reads more like a prenuptial agreement. <laughs> <laughs> but Morris's revision was not merely more elegant, but it suggested at least in Morris's mind, certainly not in everyone's mind, as subsequent decades would witness. It suggested, at least in Morris's mind, that the new government would be founded on the will and consent of the people of the capital U, capital S, United States, not on the will of the people of the individual states as sovereign entities. A fine point, perhaps, but in some very important senses, it was the point which gave Abraham Lincoln his constitutional rationale for insisting that the southern states had no right to secede from the Union in 1860-61. Obviously, that would be a point that would be contested uh, for, for the years leading up uh, to, to, the, to the Civil War. But, but Morris knew what he was doing uh, when he wrote, wrote the preamble in that fashion. Uh, this uh, next fellow, uh, Roger Sherman, is one of the three delegates uh, from Connecticut. Uh, he spoke 138 times in the convention. Only Madison, Wilson, and Governor Morris spoke, uh, spoke more often. Uh, he was, in his background, appearance, and personality, utterly unlike anyone else in the convention. He was one of the few members uh, with an interesting Benjamin Franklin probably being the uh, only other to fall in this category. Uh, one of the few members who began his life in genuinely humble circumstances. Uh, his father was a poor shoemaker, and after his father's death, Roger was left with nothing more than the humble tools of his father's trade. Uh, uh, though uh, hard, through hard work and determination, Sherman rose to a position of modest wealth, uh, but unlike almost any of our other founding fathers, I think unlike any of our other founding fathers, Sherman did so through salaried positions as a public servant serving in literally dozens of local salary paying offices, uh, ranging from inspector of pennies to county surveyor to a judge of the Connecticut Superior Court. And uh, he would hold many of these offices simultaneously, so pooling the modest salaries from, from these positions, he was actually able to, uh, to make a, a living. By the testimony of virtually everyone who recorded an impression of him, Sherman was one of the most physically ungainly specimens ever put on God's earth. <laughs> one of his fellow delegates, uh, George's William Pierce, uh, claimed that Sherman exhibited the oddest shaped character I have ever met with. Uh, and, and John Adams, who was a, an otherwise extravagant admirer of Sherman's talents, uh, described Sherman's appearance as the reverse of grace and unaccountably uh, awkward. And, and he described actually Sherman's way of, of, of speech making. Uh, and Sherman apparently had this habit. He would stand up like on the floor of the legislature. Sherman had also served in the Continental Congress and was a signer of the Declaration of Independence. He would stand up and, and he would grab his left wrist with his right hand uh, he kind of tense himself up like this, and then speaking in what uh, George Delegate William Pierce called his strange New England cant. Of course, the slow speaking uh, uh, William Pierce in his southern draw might have had a different, you know, a different way of speaking. But 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 Sherman would they look? He would carry on with his speech like this, looking kind of looking like he was trying to strangle a snake. Or <laughs> so and he's really a very awkward man. Um, uh, his uh, appearance and simple manner of dresser, I think, starkly displayed in, in this only known a portrait of him, painted by a relatively obscure artist named Robert Earle in 1775 or uh, 76. He's si seen here sitting somewhat uncomfortably in a Windsor chair, square jawed, not wearing a wig, as you know was often the custom, but most notably wearing a suit of simple country clothing where if you look carefully, and I think the room is too well lit here, but there's a big worn spot in his right hand. It's leaning here. This is the only suit the guy owns. <laughs> uh, I mean, you know, when you sit for a portrait, you in the 18th century in particular, you really do get dressed in your Sunday best, and that was as good as Roger Sherman uh, can do. So he really does strike me as the essence of Yankee simplicity and uh, frugality. The humbly born and plain spoken Sherman was the most consistent voice for compromise in the convention. Uh, although it would take nationalist-minded delegates like 
Madison, Wilson, and Governor Morris over a month to reconcile themselves to it. Sherman was the first delegate to present what would become known as the Connecticut Compromise, the uh, proposal that finally broke the six-week stalemate in the convention between the so-called large state delegates from the most populous states in the Union, who of course wanted representation in both houses of Congress apportioned according to population, and the small state delegates who wanted representation uh, uh, to be apportioned in a way that each state, regardless of its size, uh, received equal representation. Uh, representation. This was, I have to say, a singularly unedifying debate. There is no high-flown political theory involved here. This is all about the provincial interests of the various representatives of the various states, with large state delegates trying to seek maximum advantage uh, for their states, and small state delegates trying to seek maximum advantage for theirs. Sherman's solution, proportional representation in the House and equal representation in the Senate, uh, was hardly a rocket science. I think any of us in five minutes could have come up with that uh, notion. His claim to leadership rests, I think, not so much uh, with first presenting the idea to the convention, which he did in, actually in early June, but with the patient, pragmatic, and essentially unself-interested way in which he championed the proposal during the last two weeks of June and the first two weeks of July uh, of, of 17. Uh, 87. There is a sort of interesting uh, development both in, in the political sphere but also in, 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 in the academic world. Uh, uh, increasing numbers of scholars are, are really not lauding the Connecticut Compromise as a judicious compromise that enabled the convention to continue. And believe me, had they not reached that compromise, the convention would have broken apart and we would have not had uh, a, a federal uh, constitution. But, but increasingly, I think scholars are saying that this really is uh, uh, the, the most important provision rendering our constitution undemocratic, pointing to the fact that something like 10% the, the of the population in those uh, states that each have two senators uh, are uh, able actually to uh, either uh, control the Senate or at least block any uh, action uh, uh, in, in, the, in the Senate. Uh, but at that moment, uh, there's just no question that had that compromise not been, been reached, uh, the convention would have fallen apart altogether. There were at least two other individuals present at the convention who had already established truly distinguished represent, uh, reputations as leaders. One of those was that man who sat at that small table on the raised dais in the front uh, of the room. Uh, uh, this uh, portrait of Washington, by the way, was uh, uh, painted uh, during uh, uh, the recess for the July 4th uh, uh, celebrations in Philadelphia in 1787. It was painted by Charles Wilson Peale, so I, I, I selected this one because it is truly a contemporary portrait, but also because at least to me, and I, you know, I, I may be in, in, in my semiotics of the portraits of, of these guys be reading uh, too much into it, peeling off too many layers of the onion. But Washington looks a little pallid and tired uh, in, in, in this portrait. He is no longer uh, a young man. Uh, uh, he is no longer able to uh, enjoy the fox hunting at Mount Vernon, which he just uh, loved to do, although he still does enjoy dancing with beautiful ladies, uh, even at the age of uh, 55. Uh, he had been luxuriating in his retirement at Mount Vernon, and even as he was receiving anguish letters from friends decrying the perilous state of the Union under the Articles of Confederation, Washington tried mightily to resist their calls for a return to public life. But finally, responding to pleas in particular uh, from Virginia's governor, Edmund Randolph, and from Madison, Washington relented and agreed to attend the convention. He knew that the meeting uh, of uh, delegates would not be a short one. Uh, and he had no great confidence uh, that it would produce uh, a, a successful uh, outcome. Uh, he, he, he wrote uh, both to others but also ruminated to himself that, that he, he knew that his, here, here was his dilemma, he knew that his presence at that convention was absolutely essential to a successful outcome. But he also had no confidence that his very presence would ensure a successful outcome. 
And Washington was a proud man. He did not want to end his career uh, on a note uh, uh, of failure. So not only did he not want to you know, disrupt the, the peace and tranquility of his life at uh, Mount Vernon, he really did have some doubts about putting uh, his reputation uh, on, on the line. Uh, but early in the morning on May 9th, he got into his carriage and made the arduous uh, five-day trip to Philadelphia, his rheumatoid arthritis protesting every bump uh, along the way. Finally arriving on May 13th, greeted in the city by huge crowds, church bells ringing, cannons firing, the city light horse troop in its fancy dress uniforms uh, uh, out uh, to greet him. That's the good news. He really did receive a hero's welcome uh, when he arrives. But the bad news was that he was unbelievably annoyed when he discovered that the only other state delegation that had turned up on time uh, was, was, was that of Pennsylvania. I mean, he asked himself during those uh, uh, 12 days between the time of his arrival and the actual uh, start date of the convention, had he really made this trip in vain? Had he really put his reputation uh, on the line uh, in vain? He attended every session of the convention, uh, but if we're to rely only on the record of the debates, we would be inclined to regard him as a mere uh, figurehead. The way I think he is often seen a, 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 as a symbol, uh, uh, but not as a flesh and blood and, and kind of sentient uh, human being. Uh, you know, here's Alexander Hamilton in the 1790s supposedly manipulating uh, uh, Washington, a, 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 a real distortion uh, of the truth. Uh, Washington did indeed make only one brief and unexceptional speech the whole of that summer, but the record of the convention is incomplete and Eloquent speeches uh, are not the sole criterion by which to measure uh, qualities of leadership in that convention. Washington, who was unanimously elected president of the convention mm -hmm. on its first day of business, Washington presided. It was Washington who made the decision to recognize Edmund Randolph on the morning of May 29th, a decision that would launch the revolution in government so carefully planned by Madison, Wilson, Governor Morris, uh, and, and others. It was Washington, day in and day out, who would regulate the flow of debate. When it appeared that the delegates had reached an impasse on one subject, he seemed to know when to call on the appropriate delegate to change the direction of the debate to another subject. His force of personality, uh, the very force uh, of his presence, uh, his, his bearing, um, his very good, and I would argue intimate, uh, 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 in a chaste sense of that word, intimate friend uh, Elizabeth Powell. Uh, 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 this is a relationship which is a subject for a whole other talk. Washington's remarkable relationship with Elizabeth Powell, the wife of the wealthy Philadelphia merchant Samuel Powell, over the course of that summer. But Elizabeth Powell, in, 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 in writing to Washington in 1792, persuading him to run for a second term as president, I said of him that you have a dominion over yourself, this amazing sense of self-control that no other man uh, in America possesses. And I think that phrase, a dominion over yourself, uh, describes Washington better than any, any phrase I, I can think of. And that uh, dominion over uh, himself and the very force of Washington's presence and example forced delegates to temper their remarks, to maintain civility, even when the strength of their feelings might have led them to incivility. And on those few occasions when a delegate did allow his passion <coughs> to get the better of him, Washington knew when to recognize some other more conciliatory speaker. Nowhere was this more apparent, nor more important than in the torturous debate over the character and powers of the American presidency, a vexed subject which confounded the delegates nearly the whole uh, of the summer, really from July 16th after the adoption of the Connecticut Compromise up through almost the, the very end. The delegates are confounded about what to do uh, with the office uh, of the chief executive. Although the, the, the debates on that subject often uh, became heated with some delegates rising to warn of the dangers uh, of an elective monarchy. Elbridge Gerry rises and looking right at Washington gives a particularly offensive speech in which he predicts that the executive will immediately degenerate into uh, a, a tyrant. 
Uh, but uh, as the delegates uh, did that, everyone in the room, except perhaps Elbridge Gerry, knew that the future first president of the United States, should there be a United States, the, first, the future first president was sitting on that chair on the raised dais in the front of the room. The framers were united with the notable exception of Alexander Hamilton, whom I have deliberately excluded from my gallery uh, of leaders. I, I, I have concluded that he was really a highly ineffective delegate to the Constitutional uh, Convention. Uh, nearly all of the delegates, with, Ham with Hamilton being the exception, were united in their desire to avoid an elective monarch. But the fact that the framers went as far as they did in granting to the president at least limited executive power owes, I believe, to their confidence in the inherent virtue and self-restraint uh, of George Washington. His presence at that convention was absolutely essential. My brief a snapshot of some of the key individuals at the convention concludes, I think, uh, for me anyway, appropriately, uh, uh, with the man who founded my university, mm -hmm. uh, Benjamin Franklin. For it was Franklin more than any other delegate who recognized that acts of collective leadership were ultimately more important than feats of individual uh, brilliance. Although Franklin missed the opening day of the convention uh, due to a painful attack of kidney stones, he did attend every uh, session every day thereafter. His contributions to the debates were, to put it charitably, uh, uneven. Uh, there were moments when the delegates must have simply rolled their eyes heavenward when he put forward some of his uh, pet uh, proposals. He did seem to sort of dip in and out of senility during the summer. Uh, at one point, for example, he proposed that justices of the Supreme Court be selected by, by what he called the Scotch method which was by a vote among all of the lawyers of the country uh, who would, he reasoned, vote for the ablest among them in order to get rid of their competitors <laughs> and, and then share their practices among themselves. <laughs> so, so, you know, I mean, our Supreme Court confirmation co processes are, are painful enough as they are. <laughs> Can you imagine what would happen if we resorted to that method today. And in, in that case, as in many others, it, you know, uh, Washington or other delegates would rise and say, thank you very much, Dr. Franklin, for that. And then they go on to other business. But when Franklin was good, he was very good. And at no point was he better than on the final day of the convention. On September 17th, he rose with a speech in his hand to give the last important speech that he would make in his life. He was actually too weakened by age and illness to read the speech himself, and he had James Wilson uh, read it for him. Looking back over the nearly four months of debate, disagreement, and occasional outbursts of ill temper, Franklin observed that whenever you assemble a number of men to have the advantage of their joint wisdom, you inevitably assemble with those men all their prejudices, their passions, their errors of opinion, their local interests, and their selfish views. Such a remarkably accurate statement. From such an assembly, Franklin asked, can a perfect production ever be expected? He admitted that there were still some parts of the Constitution which he himself did not approve. But he said, the older I grow, the more apt I am to doubt my own judgment and to pay more respect to the judgment of others. He then asked those delegates who may still have objections to the Constitution to doubt a little of your own infallibility and affix your signatures to the document in spite of your objections. 39 of the 42 delegates uh, present uh, that day, many of them still harboring serious reservations about particular aspects of the document, came forward to sign the Constitution and did so in precisely the spirit of fallibility and conciliation which Franklin had urged upon them. As we look back on their actions from the vantage point of our own intensely partisan and mean-spirited age, it does in seem, indeed seem to me that all of us, both ordinary citizens and our political leaders, have so much to learn from the collective wisdom and humility displayed by those men who spent that long, hot summer in Philadelphia. Uh, as our nation moves forward to confront a daunting array of, uh, of challenges in the economy and our healthcare system on controversial issues regarding uh, 
uh, immigration, not to mention the terrifying threats that we face in multiple parts of the world. We can only hope that our nation's leaders in all three <coughs> branches of our, our government, uh, that all of our leaders might absorb that particular lesson in leadership. In humility, the ability to doubt a little their own egocentric sense of infallibility, the wisdom to not allow their sense of the perfect to be the enemy of the good. We can only hope that our nation's leaders will absorb that particular lesson from Benjamin Franklin, the oldest of our founding fathers. Thank you very much for your <laughs>
Uh, and then they would go and have what's called a club dinner, which is kind of like a buffet dinner with lots of food and drink that they could choose from that would go on uh, for a couple of hours. And I think that's really where uh, a lot of the sort of debriefing of the day's proceedings occurred. Then on, on, on weekends, they would often be invited out to the country houses of some of the cities, uh, city's leading citizens, and they'd have their club dinners uh, out of town. Uh, but a very different ambiance than what occurs in D.C. today. What aspects of the current political climate and structure do you think the Founding Fathers would be most surprised by? Well, I... Uh, um, like judicial activism, um, executive power, that sort of thing. Well, um, so if, if you... Uh, and, and actually, this... this, this it, goes to a point you made earlier. I mean, these leaps from the 21st century to the late 18th century are very dangerous. Um, uh, they would, of course, be astounded by the growth of federal power in every branch of government. They would be, uh, even the most nationalistic among them, Governor Morris, say, or Madison in his early incarnation at the beginning of the convention, they would have been astounded uh, by the growth of the federal power, but they also would be astounded by the development of an interdependent global economy and, and all of the other cultural and economic and social developments that have occurred in the country. So um, it, it's, it's just, uh, they, uh, part of what I'm trying to say about these folks is that they were part of a particular political culture of the late 18th century that is not easily recoverable. Uh, in today's age. Certainly, they all assumed that Congress would be the most powerful and active uh, and important branch of the government. Uh, they left executive powers undefined uh, in part because they considered the executive branch to be a subordinate branch, but also because they could not agree, in fact, on what those powers might actually be. And certainly, I mean, that if you read Article Three, I mean, it basically doesn't say anything. Uh, uh, so they, 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 they would, I think, be quite, uh, maybe even astonished um, to see uh, the, the way in which the court occupies a central position in our political and constitutional debates uh, today. Okay, one more question. Go ahead. If, uh, Picking up on what you just stated, if the Founding Fathers believed that Congress was going to be the most important body, uh, today we've sort of gone the way of Rome, where the Senate first uh, was important and then Caesar crossed the, uh, what was the route, uh, went into Rome and became emperor. Uh, now the executive seems to have uh, served a lot of powers that should be exercised by Congress, and I think that's what a lot of people are complaining about. Uh, so certainly that balance has shifted, and, 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 and a good deal of the explanation for that has to do with vigorous assertion of executive power, not only in the first of the chief executive, but by all the myriad executive agencies that exercise administrative power to execute the laws of Congress. But I think some of the... <laughs> If, you, if it's blame that is to be laid, uh, lay at Congress's uh, door as well, uh, particularly today when the Congress seems nearly dysfunctional. So let me tell you about lunch. <laughs> <laughs> there is lunch. Lunch is next door. It's room 108. You go out the door, cross the hall, get lunch. Now, where are you going to dine? Right back here. <laughs> we just don't have a dining room large enough for everyone. So get your lunch. Bring it back in here. Uh, our, our friends upstairs who are listening to this as a simulcast, they will bring their lunch to the second floor, and we will reconvene at 2.15. Okay? We'll reconvene at 2.15.